Harun Mirza. I'm the Director of Business Development for Anonymous Video Analytics at Intel Corporation, and formerly I was the co-founder and CEO of a company called Cognitive Mission, which was acquired by Intel last year. So a little bit of background. Cognitive Vision was a startup, a Canadian startup, that developed what we call anonymous video analytics technologies. And essentially what we did was we built face detection systems and people accounting systems that helped retailers, brands, and digital signage networks better understand the return on investment on marketing campaigns and return on objectives on marketing campaigns. Here are a uh, few key milestones for Cognitive Vision. In 2006, Cognitive Vision was founded. In 2007, we were a semi-finalist for the TyQuest Business Venture Competition. In 2008, we launched our first solutions to market. That was version 1.0. In 2009 and 2010, it was a pretty heck of a ride. We were growing our company. We were actually ranked as the number one most innovative company in Canada by the Canadian Innovation Exchange. And in September of 2010, we were acquired by Intel. So I thought I'd start off by telling you about uh, entrepreneurial discovery, which is how and why I became an entrepreneur. So in 2004, I graduated with a major in corporate finance from university and entered the workforce. And when I entered the workforce, I asked a few key questions of myself when I hit about the year mark into my experience. I said and asked, what is my life goal and can I achieve it on the path that I'm on? So my life goal was to, and still is, to serve humanity through giving back by means of helping third world countries implement infrastructure for healthcare and education. That's my life goal, my purpose. So then I thought, how would I do this? And my method to giving back to the world was to generate capital and then funnel it back to the third world. And I quickly realized that if I'm an employee, it would not be very feasible to make meaningful uh, differences in the planet in the way I wanted to. Then I asked myself another question, is what do I enjoy doing? So this was pretty interesting, because when I was working, I would think about what I enjoyed about my job. Now, I was a financial analyst. What I did not like about my job was sitting behind a desk doing financial analyst stuff. What I enjoyed was meeting people, building relationships, presenting, and the human side of things. So I figured, okay, I don't think I can achieve my life goal as an employee, but I do enjoy dealing with people. And then I thought about what could, what's a path that could help me achieve my life goal? And I figured the only way I could amass a capital to give back was entrepreneurship. But then I realized something else. I didn't know anything about entrepreneurship. So I still needed to learn things. Now, I learned a lot in the corporate world, but I recognized very quickly that if I'm going to learn to become an entrepreneur, I have to talk to other entrepreneurs. I need to read books by entrepreneurs. I need to be sitting in rooms just like you are today, listening to people who have been there and done that. That's the only way to not reinvent the wheel. And then I asked another question, which is really important for me. Am I happy? And am I following my heart? As cheesy as that may sound, um, there was a, a very famous entrepreneur, Desh Deshpande, who actually came to Toronto. And he said that, look, every day is one of two things. It's either exciting or it's a chore. It's one of the two things. And if too many days go by in a row where you feel like what you're doing is a chore, stop doing what you're doing. Go do something exciting because life is too short. And I completely identified with that. And I realized very quickly about a year into my corporate experience, I was not happy and I was not following my heart. So at that point, I made a call. It was at the end of 2005 to uh, resign. And I wanted to embark on an entrepreneurial journey, but I didn't have any ideas yet. And I'm going to walk you through what I did next. So first off, there are, before I talk about idea generation, I think there are three key challenges that a lot of people face when it comes to ideas. One is you want to be an entrepreneur, but you don't have any ideas. Two, you want to be an entrepreneur and you have too many ideas, so you can't pick one. And three, you're working on an idea and you're so emotionally attached to it, it's not showing any progress, and you're unwilling to evolve it, adapt it, or kill it because you're too emotionally attached. So these are the three types of circumstances that I've found that people find themselves in. And now I'm going to talk about how to address those three areas, looking back at what I call a stage of my life, which was the brainstorming weekends. So back in 2004, 2005 time frame, uh, my two co-founders, Shazad and Faisal, and myself, what we used to do on weekends for fun was brainstorm business ideas. We weren't very social people, I guess, at the time. And we actually enjoyed 
locking herself in Shazad's apartment and just thinking up of what the next great business idea would be. And ultimately, it was that process, a systematic process, that actually helped us identify what would become Cognivision. And I'm going to walk you through what that process was. So first off, it starts off with idea generation. Now, what we did was keep in mind that I was very young at the time, about 24, 25 time frame. I didn't have a lot of experience to draw on. So I figured, okay, how do I find this elusive pain everybody talks about? Because I don't have as much experience right now. So my objective was identify industries that feel pain in large and growing markets. The way we did this was essentially reading, immersing ourselves in tons of knowledge. What we did was read general news, technology news, magazines, and blogs. And when you start doing this, it's actually quite overwhelming because it's a lot of information to take in. But what's really interesting is when you keep doing it and doing it and doing it, you see these patterns start to emerge and trends start to emerge, and it all just starts to make sense. Then what we also do is we talk to people in our networks, talk to them about what's frustrating them. You know, how's, your, how's your work going? You know, to the other speakers' points as well. What are things you don't like about your job? And that's another source of ideas. But what's key is, if you don't know many people or if you don't have that much experience, you have the internet, you have Google, search and read because there's a ton of information out there to find that pain. Then we brainstormed. So first off, the idea was, let's go find some pain. And I'm gonna actually quickly walk through how we found Cognivision. This is the idea that became Cognivision. We actually stumbled on an article. This article said, look, there's this industry called the digital signage industry. Digital signage, by the way, if you walk into uh, Tim Hortons, you've got these digital screens above the menus, or, and those screens keep changing what's on them. Those are called digital signs. And there's an entire industry built around them. And a lot of companies, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get advertisers to advertise on those screens. But they're having a difficult time doing so. So there was this article that said, look, this industry is not growing as fast as it could because advertisers want numbers and metrics. Just like when you're on the web, you know how many people went to a website, they want to know how many people are looking at these screens, how long are they looking for, are they male or female, and how old are they? And there was just this article talking about it was really frustrating that this problem existed for the industry. So what the three of us thought was, wait a second, okay, that's an interesting problem. Shazad, our co-founder, had a PhD in computer science focusing on computer vision. So our thinking was, could we build a face detection technology that can determine gender, determine age bracket, and actually answer all the questions that were outlined for us in this article? So this is where brainstorming comes into play. Once you've thought about a lot of potential pain points in the world, in different industries, think about solutions that would really be a painkiller and not a vitamin pill, you know, to repeat your earlier point. And this is the way I think about painkillers and vitamin pills. If I'm feeling perfectly fine today and you came up to me and said, hey, do you want the vitamin because it'll make you feel 10% better? I don't know, I don't know, if maybe I'll try it, maybe I won't, but there's no compelling reason. But let's say I walked into this room and I stepped on this giant metal, I don't know, like a nail coming out of the ground. My foot penetrates through, I walk out and I'm gushing blood and I'm feeling a lot of pain. Now you come to me and say, hey, if you take this magical pill, you'll fully heal and all your pain will go away. I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get that pill. So the thing is, it's just like that in business. All you need to do is you need to find that pain that they have. Because when you're going to go solve the pain, people will be willing to pay you. People will be willing to do amazing things just to get that solution from you. So one was, once we figured out a whole bunch of different pain opportunities out in the market, the thing was, can we come up with solutions to take the pain away? We performed competitive research to make sure, well, who else is out there doing what we're doing? Is it unique what we're doing? Is there a you know, massive bloody red ocean out there we're about to enter. And you could also search for patents and patent applications as well, which is really important because you want to understand what the intellectual property landscape is looking like. And you never know, you might stumble across something that's very unique, and the sheer act of doing research when you see tons and tons of different data points may actually foster a new innovation in itself. So the 2.5 day generation, find the pain, and then brainstorm up painkillers, not vitamin pills. Now, when you have some ideas, you have to filter those ideas. What we would always do is, first off, find the Achilles heel. You have to stay objective, avoid getting emotionally attached, and look for weaknesses, right? At times, this is your brainchild, and it's hard to kill your brainchild, and that's what you need to do. So what we would do is we have all these ideas, and we just attack all of them, and think about why they would fail. And what this will actually do is it's going to kill most of your ideas. But the few ones that actually survive to step three, well, then you move on to step four. Step four is, when you're going through this whole idea generation process, 
you need to start rating and ranking your ideas. So what we did was, we would very quickly, between the three of us, rate and rank our ideas very, in a very simple format. We say, okay, ideal, ideas are either A's, they're great, <coughs> B's, so-so, and C's, we're gonna discard them. What we do is go through and very quickly vote. Our ideas A's, B's, or C's. After we've gone through it once, we basically see, okay, what ideas are still B's? We do a bit more homework on the B's, and they have to be recategorized as A's or C's. And then, moving on, we would only ever look at the A ideas, which were the great ideas. Or so we thought, anyway. Now, after you filter your ideas, you need to expand on your ideas. So now we're already looking at those A ideas, which the three of us in a little apartment thought were actually pretty interesting and pretty good. So what we would do now is we would come up with a very high level skeletal business plan. I'm not talking about a 30 page document, I'm talking about a one to two pager which talks very clearly about here's the value prop, our value proposition, here's the market that we're going after, here's how big the market is, here's the competitive landscape, some very high level general information on the actual business idea. What we knew was that every potential business idea had to be providing a solution in a large and growing market and then after we created these frameworks, we would again go through steps three and four, which was to find the activity seal this time in the plan, and to rate and rank the plan, and only focus on the A ideas and the A plans. So now you've got some plans, you know, a bit more of a flushed out idea. Now you have to validate them. Now validation is really important because so far up to this stage, it's just been three guys in a room brainstorming, in our case. So at this point, you meet, you have to start talking to people. Talk to people in your personal networks. You can talk to people like your friends, I suppose, but ideally industry experts are great. Uh, talk to, if you have mentors as well. But very importantly, talk to potential customers and partners. Cold call, email, it's a numbers game. You will never know who will respond if you don't try, right? So what we would start to do is immediately call up companies that we thought might be interested in buying your technology or partnering with us. And the question is, why are we doing this? Well, we wanted to get market validation very quickly before we invested too much time and effort into an idea. And we wanted to ensure that the problem we thought we were solving actually is a problem and that people are willing to pay for it. And the only way you're gonna really know how to do that is when you get outside and start talking with potential customers and partners. And this is the hardest part. Ideas that did not receive positive feedback I mean, you don't have to kill them immediately, but you will have to either evolve them, then revalidate, and ultimately, if you're not getting anywhere with them, what we decided to do was scrap them and move on. Because time is money, and every minute that you're spending on an idea that's not going to work is a minute that you're not spending on something that potentially could work. Now, when you have ideally some ideas that have gone through the first six steps, just get out there and do it. Try out your ideas. Find a mentor, and this is where, by the way, Ty is fantastic. Link up with Ty. We have charter members in the organization that can actually guide you along the way if you've never done this before. And it was a huge help to us. And determine your success metrics. So before you get emotionally attached to a business idea, figure out from day one, all right, what would mean that it's time to kill this idea? So you decide, all right, if in 90 days, 180 days, whatever, we have not achieved the following objectives, it's really easy before you actually embark on the journey to decide that I would kill this idea then. Because if you're emotionally attached and you're three months in, it's really difficult to do so. To do that early on. Because it is better to fail cheap and fast. And remember that there's nothing wrong with failure. In fact, you embrace failure. Look, like if, let's say for argument's sake that for every 10 business ideas, one will succeed. You can either spend a lot of time trying to find that one or try 10 different ideas. So fail fast, fail cheap. And let me also talk about failure one more time. The amazing thing about failure is that it's not defeat. Okay? You're only defeated when you give up. It's perfectly fine to fail and then try again. Now how do you do it? Rapid prototype. Get feedback uh, on your prototypes. Heck, put together presentations and go out there and present um, graphical user interfaces and mock-ups about what you're trying to achieve. Just get feedback and figure out, am I on the right path? I read your ideas, evolve, and gain traction. Traction can be many things, you know, your first pilot customers, your first sales, what have you. Just define what traction means to you and start to progress forward with your ideas. And ultimately, succeed. And the hardest part about all of this, I just think, is 
when, when you're really diving deep into a business idea and you get too emotionally attached, it becomes very difficult to digest something that could mean failure. But remember, there's nothing wrong with it. It's a quick summary about the seven steps. Find the pain. Brainstorm up solutions that are going to be viewed as painkillers. Find the Achilles heels in your idea. Try to kill your ideas. All right? Because only the strong survive, and that's really important over here. Rate and rank your ideas and only focus on the A's. Remember, we have A ideas that are great, B ideas that are so-so, and C ideas that are going to kill. Focus on the A's. <clears throat> Create some plans to flesh out those ideas. Validate the ideas by getting out and talking to people that would actually open up their pocketbooks and potentially pay you for them. If they're unwilling to actually pay you, you have an issue and move on to another idea. And ultimately, when you have something that's validated at that point, get out there and do it. This is the art of the hustle. You have to have passion, you have to execute, just get out and make it happen. And remember that, you know, at times when you're creating plans and all that, everybody thinks, man, what a waste of time this is, right? And honestly, to, to a certain extent, the actual plan you create is probably not going to be representative of what you're actually going to do out there in the marketplace. But the process of planning is critical. Because when you're going through the process of planning, you begin to think a different way. You begin to see ideas in a different light. When you're on your 10th idea and you finally killed it, very quickly your intuition is going to start kicking in because you've learned so much about the process that you're going to start getting better and better quality ideas through the door. Now very quickly, I just wanted to touch upon some excellent reading, uh, which I would highly recommend. There's a book called The Four Steps to the Epiphany. People have called this book the Bible for technology companies in Silicon Valley. It's written by an author called Steve Blank. He actually walks through a systematic process of how to get your ideas from, I guess, a, a pure idea stage, how to generate a good idea, all the way through to commercialization. Another great book is The Art of the Start by Guy Kawasaki. Walks through even everything from how to create your first presentation deck, how to articulate your vision. And The Four Hour Work Week, this is a really fun book uh, by Tim Ferriss, who claims to only have, at the time, worked about four hours a week running a, I think, $800,000 a year business. And that became a number one bestseller, and I think he made a lot of money after that, too. But Tim Ferriss in the four-hour work week talks about lifestyle design. Coming up with interesting, unique ideas, failing fast, how to come up with cool potential concepts which you can build with for really low amounts of capital that could potentially succeed. It's a different <coughs> way of thinking uh, to do things with very low startup capital and uh, to potentially get some pretty cool business ideas as well. And all of that is actually the entirety of my presentation. So I'd love to open up the floor to any questions if you have any about my experience. Thank you.